And good day. Welcome to Cooking Something Good. I'm your host, Dave Duso. Surgery is needed. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. There was a grizzly bear. It was attacking an entire neighborhood. I jumped on its back, wrestled it to the ground, got it into a chokehold until the grizzly bear became unconscious. But when it became unconscious, it rested on top of my finger, which caused my tendon to slip out of place. So was it worth saving thousands of lives? No, because it hurts like hell. What really happened? I tried to get out of bed without waking up my dog, L the mini golden doodle, and I slipped the tendon out of place and they're gonna have to do surgery. So no cooking with my right hand. And you learn things ah, when you do things. Let's not do that again. You learn things when, when you can't do things with your right hand. I've learned that uh, there are a lot of things I can do left-handed. I, sh I brush my teeth left-handed anyway. I eat left-handed. I've always been able to kick left-footed and right-footed. I've always golfed and batted left and right. Uh, I can write a little bit left-handed, but it's not great. There are a couple of things I can't do at all left-handed. One of them is private. That makes it very difficult. And the other thing is, for whatever reason, I cannot shave left-handed at all. I did not know this. For whatever reason, now I can eat left-handed. I eat left-handed naturally. I don't eat with my right hand, but I can't get food in my mouth with my right hand. I just can't even get it on the fork. But I shave with my right hand, and I can't shave at all with my left hand. I tried. So I'm going to go to a barber shop on Friday, and I'm going to get a shave. Hmm. One of those sharp we'll see what happens hey it's time for another great episode of cooking something good today we've got my good friend damien de paola uh, owner of carmelina's in boston uh, damien's owned a lot of restaurants uh, over the years he may be the best chef i've ever met and i don't think that's me embellishing at all uh if he's not then i met a chef when i wasn't conscious uh, he is an amazing chef. He's had a, just an incredible career. So many of his sous chefs have gone on to own their own restaurants. It's something he's very proud of. He's going to talk about that. We're going to talk about a trip we had uh, years ago, him and I and uh, and his nephew, Luca, who now owns a great restaurant, Carmen's, Carmine's in Newburyport, Massachusetts, our trip to Paris, France. And Damien is going to remind me what a clown I am and how forgetful I am. You're going to notice that the interview picks up almost like we're in the middle of the interview because Jack, the producer, our executive producer, wasn't here for that interview. And I had to touch all the buttons by myself and I didn't hit the record button. So we missed out on about the first 12 minutes. We'll catch up after that. Uh, it's a really fun interview, Damien. Great guy. Uh, interesting story amazing amazing uh, story all he's done and all the people he's brought into the to the cooking world and we're so fortunate to have people like kevin cousins down at tosca martin uh, over at alina's in hadley massachusetts luca the list goes on and on luca at carmine's in uh, newburyport massachusetts of course damien's restaurant so many more and we're going to talk about all those things today on cooking something a good so let's get to it right now in the last oh that was going on sorry about that that was me oh you weren't recording this whole time uh, i was i just wasn't uh recording on the i was recording on the audacity there's two things all right well you know what you're doing i guess right uh so, sometimes uh, i do and sometimes i don't my friend but anyway uh you know, I've been taking it easy. Uh, I've had a little bit of high blood pressure, some minor heart issues, but we are taking care of those as we speak. 
And, you know, uh, diet's everything. You know, I don't want to take medication. So I cut out sugar. So it's been, how did you, it's been, how did you do that? I mean, I have type two diabetes and I'm I can't cut sugar I'm on a high blood pressure medication, but I can't cut this. I'll tell you at five o'clock, I'll be good. I remember that song. Remember that old song? The daytime I'm Mr. Natural, just happy as I can be. But at night, I'm a junk food junkie. Good Lord, have pity on me. No, but I remember this song. Dave do so. Dave do so. Uh, you can't go there. We can't go there. We can't go there. I'm with Damiano de Paula. Oh, he's frozen. Damien is frozen. Look at him. Frozen in Mexico on the ocean. How good does that get? He's back. What? I, you just so, had a so, perfect pose, frozen with you on the ocean with Mexico behind you. That's it was beautiful. like it was like a professional photographer came in and took the shot. But yeah, so for the last two months, no sugar at all, not missing it. Um, my, how, do you, my, how do you do it? My key, my key sugar consumption, believe it or not, was coffee. So I cut out caffeine, cold turkey, no problem. I don't even miss it. I cut out sugar. How do I do it? I, I cut out, I eat pasta once a week. Maybe yeah, I'll have a little cut. pizza. How can you only eat pizza. pasta once a week? Every two, listen, the gluten it was fucking blowing me up. Every time I had a, if I had like in the morning, I had eggs with bread, you know, I, I just felt my stomach just, just blowing up and making me feel like shit. Um, so I cut sugar, I cut caffeine, I cut gluten. But again, a little pasta once in a while, I have to, I'm Italian, right? I cut all that crap out that's not good. I cut out no deep fried, no bad fats. I cut it all out. I've probably lost about 15 pounds. I don't take uh, no more heartburn medication, no more cholesterol medication. I don't take any of that. I feel good. Uh, I honestly, at my age right now, I, I feel like I'm 30 years old. I feel uh, half my age. I really do, Dave. I feel yeah. like I can't get off the sugar. And the caffeine, I didn't know caffeine had sugar. I don't drink milk in my coffee. Oh, caffeine don't have sugar. I was putting the sugar in the caffeine, but caffeine's bad for you anyway. You know, I didn't drink coffee till I was 56 years old. Now I drink four cups every morning before seven. And I just got back from Puglia. And I'll tell you what. You were in Puglia? I was in Puglia for 16, 14, 15 days. That's where my grandmother's from. Yeah, she's from Monopoly, right? In, uh, in the, the old Monopoly? Yeah, oh my God, Monopoly's gorgeous. Did you just stay there or did you move around? Uh, we stayed there for four nights and we went down to like to, to uh, on our way, halfway from there to Brindisi. To Brindisi. Uh, uh, Brindisi, for Brindisi. Christ. You go there and even know where the fuck you went. I didn't go there. And we went to, uh, then I went to Bari because that's where the family's from. Too. Bari, yeah. I didn't get to Tori, but then we stayed, uh, I don't know, 10 miles south of Monopoly. At a, at a really Gallipoli, place. did you go to Gallipoli? Yep. Puglia, uh, Puglia is underrated. I love Puglia, it. Puglia is one of the most beautiful. All of Italy is beautiful when all is said and done. But southern Italy is the best. And Puglia has great food, beautiful coastline, like unbelievable coastline. Yeah. Beautiful beaches. It, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's nice. And we, stayed, and we stayed in the old city. We had a beautiful bed and breakfast in the old city overlooking, you know, the, the, um, Where? in the Monopoly or in Monopoly, in Monopoly. So, you know, you're looking out and the boats go out of that little, uh, yeah. the breaker and the boats, we were right on the water where that breaker is. And, you know, now that I love coffee, I mean, I learned, I, I don't speak Italian, but I learned how to say, uh, do a cafe latte, por favor, porta via. Can I have two coffees, oh, second, please? That's that's insane. Insane. You've known me for so many years. Let me, let me tell you how long we've known each other and, and get ready to fall off your chair. We've known each other for about 39 years, 38, 39 years. And the first thing you said besides barging and are we frozen or are you just completely still right now? I'm oh, wow. Okay, there you go. Um, I remember the first day I met you, you're not banging on the back door of Carmelina's. Demanding pasta. Putanesca. Donna, like, who was this fucking guy? Like, we first... We didn't know how, we didn't know how to how to deal with you, but you were very funny, charismatic, uh, charming, and you just made us laugh every time we saw you. And, and you always had such good energy. And, and I miss you. I know I'm not around a lot when you come down, yeah. but I consider you one of my best friends. I appreciate uh, that. I agree, and I feel the same way. 
especially from those days. And when people are tight, good friends, doesn't mean they have to talk to each other every day, but we, we have that connection, you know? Yeah. Those were good times. Remember my stand-up routine in the Metro in Paris? Wow. Yeah. What was it like? I just flew in from Boston. In my and Luca, Luca, Luca remember. He's only 30, 45. That kid remembers everything. But I forgot about that. I got a standing ovation. Up, and I was like speaking. And nobody Russian. understood you. No, my pigeon French and English mixed up. But I tell you, I I did get a compliment. Uh, the uh, the kid who worked at the coffee shop, I, I fell in love with Italian coffee. I really liked it. But he uh, he said, uh, he said, if you- One in the North there, End? No, no, the no, one no. In, in, in Monopoly. Oh, you said you had a great pronunciation for the one phrase that you know? Pozo avere due cafe, por favor. Two coffees. Is that right? Can I have two coffees, please? Yeah, you know it's right. You yeah, and then, it's... If you want to, then if you want to say to go, it's Porta Via. Porta Via? Porta Via. Yeah. Porta Via. Yeah, so it was, you don't uh, want it. Oh, espresso's all about espresso, fast. Uh, I like that. I, I tell you what, I love the coffee. I love the language. And uh, tell me if I'm crazy. I've been, that's my, that's my, that's my third trip to Italy. Okay. I've been to Florence, been to Rome, did all that. My first time to, to this area where the Bellinduano, my family's from, the smells, the taste of the food, the dialect, it reminded me more of family than any other part of Italy. Well, the Pugliese dialect is, I mean, people say the Italian dialect is crazy. The Pugliese dialect is very difficult to understand it's like such a small country as you know the italian national language that which everyone knows and then you have all these dialects and pugliese like oh my god it's so hard to understand that i i speak fluent italian i speak fluent sicilian neapolitan but i can't get the pugliese down man it's tough it reminded me of my it reminded me of my of the house when i was a little boy and all you know all the uncles and aunts were all running around the house and the taste too i had a I had a, a boulognese and it was, there wasn't many ingredients, but it tasted just like my nona's. And the old lady told me, she said, you know, I, I sear the, I sear my pork. And then after I cook it, uh, I, I take a, she shreds it. She shreds her, it up. Shreds yeah, so it's more like a ragu, not a bolognese. A ragu, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's what my grandmother used to do. Exactly. But, uh, do. We had that at Camelinas too. We would, remember we cooked the whole pieces, we'd break them up. Yeah, I used to eat that Real pork and beef. And then Vinny would eat it like sloppy Joe's, that son of a gun. He probably would eat three pounds a, a week. Uh, He'd come in the restaurant to, to get ready and he would scoop it out. It was so thick. And then he would uh, heat it up and then he would put it between two big things of bread like that, like the Gavon that he was. That's too Vinny, much I hope you're listening to this. And uh, Too much bread. He wouldn't have enough of Vinny. He would scoff it right down. But I'm having the, a hard time. We, we, you know, we're talking about, you know, influence and stuff like that. And, and I appreciate your comment that about me being a chef and everything, but my whole thing was the simplicity, things that your mother cooked, things that your father cooked, things that my grandmother cooked, just those beautiful, simple dishes with, with maybe a little bit of a spin to, to make them mine. You know what I mean? Just, just like all the guys did the same thing. And, and and good good cuisine is just that you can't overdo it. Sometimes you go on Instagram or, or on Facebook and you see these people that are doing they're doing these crazy concoctions of food and people are like drooling, oh my God. And it's like 20 ingredients and massive big amounts of stuff with with pounds of cheese dripping on the side and then a sauce and then this and that. Honestly, that's too disgusting. When you go out to eat for dinner, you know, it, it's, you're dining, you're not feeding. There's a difference. And, and, and that's why I like to eat at the restaurants where I know that they're going to make sure that the main component of the dish is not masked, whether it's a piece of sea bass or a, a short rib or, you know, free range, whole chick, whatever. Yeah. Let me taste that component. And then, complement it with some other ingredients, but don't overwhelm it, you know? I went to a little restaurant in Monopoly and they had a, um, they had artichoke. It was almost like an art, a ball of artichoke. It was finely shredded. It was unbelievable. It was so good. So I asked them, I said, what, what, what else, what's in there? And so after the cook came out, he's actually going to do the show in a couple of weeks, but, uh, and his English was pretty good. 
I said, what do you get? It's artichoke. Art, uh, artichoke. Artichoke. Uh, yeah. And he said, uh, I said, what else? He goes, oh, some salt, some pepper, some olive oil, an artichoke. I guarantee you it had a little bit of garlic. Yep. That's what he said. Olive oil, garlic. Yep. Olive there was pasta, some a little olive oil and probably some nice pecorino or parmigiano mixed in with the, with the mix. And that's it. You know what I like the most about Italy? This is my favorite thing. You don't eat till eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. The kids are running around in the street. You eat. It takes a long time. You're talking. You're in, you're conversing with people. You're enjoying a nice glass of wine. You're. It, it's just that whole. This is the way you're supposed to live. I really enjoyed it. I, I mean, it, it's good to see. Like I've been, I've been back to Italy in the last, <clears throat> the last three years, maybe five times, six times, and. Um, the family dynamic is still there, especially in the South. Yeah. You still have the, you know, the kids, whether they're married uh, with children themselves, there's always the Sunday dinner still, which we've lost yeah. in America. I miss that. I miss that. Sunday dinners, once my, my mom and dad passed away, that was the end of it. People move away, you know, then everybody's too busy with this bullshit, you know, on Instagram and they're with their friends and they don't even have time for that meal. That meal was very important to us growing up. And, and, and what it did was it reinforced the family dynamic because at those meals, we could talk about anything at the table and, and everybody listened, everybody spoke, everyone contributed to the conversation or, or had their uh, point of view and perspective. And it was just so great because that's when you really got to know everyone. You didn't get to know Everybody, you walk, you know, you go home, you go to sleep, you wake up, your sisters are at the table, maybe you have a coffee, boom, off to school, off to work, whatever. The whole family dinner was 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 what brought families together, what made us learn, what made me love my uncles that I would see maybe once a week. But those time that those four or five hours, because that's how long Sunday dinner was. Yeah. It went from like one o'clock to six o'clock. You know, it started with with my mother frying meatballs, roasted peppers, eggplant. Everybody standing up in the kitchen and eating antipasto and talking and drinking some wine. Then we sat down and then we ate more. Yeah. Then we sat down and we had the pasta. We had the whatever meats my mother made or whatever fish, all the vegetables. And then we, we relaxed a little bit. And then the bottles came out, yeah. the digestivo, the Sambuca, the anisette, you know, the, the Amaro, you know, to digest. And then the nuts. And then the fruit and then the pastries and the coffee and nobody wanted to leave that table everybody wanted to stay right until the end because we laughed we busted balls we joked around it was like in italy whether whether i was a five-year-old kid at the table or 25 i felt that i always had the same sort of experience and, and contribution uh no matter what. And it's, it's sad, but those days are gone. And they are. Let me ask Unless you, you go to Italy. What, yeah. What part did that play in your development as a, as a human being, as a person, your communication skills, your, your ability to deal with confrontation, your ability to be compassionate, all those things happened at that table. All those experiences you you saw growing up there. So when you see them in life as a grown person, you're like, yeah, I know. I understand the psychology of what's going on. And I've seen this before. That's, that's an yeah. experience. I mean, am I wrong with that? No, no, you're very right. It, it does. I mean, especially for me, you know, I mean, I got into the restaurant business by accident. You, you know, the story. Yeah, I know right? the story, yeah. Tell John with a green card. And uh, I never wanted to be in the restaurant business, but I loved to cook at home. Yeah. I cooked for, when I was at UMass, I cooked for my dates. I would invite girls over and I would cook for them. And they would instantly fall in love. Everyone loves a guy that knows how to cook. Yeah. And then me and my friends would pitch in 10 bucks, 20 bucks each. And we'd buy lobsters. We'd buy veal. We'd buy bottles of wine. We would, they would buy all the ingredients we pitch in. And then I would cook for everybody. And, and that's how the whole thing started. It was like, I just, growing up at that dinner table, it just really turned eating into a social event not just i have to eat to survive but 
eating became a highlight. It was a social event, whether it was with a, with a beautiful girl, whether it was with all my friends, or whether it was cooking in the restaurant crazy, 300 people, a ton of slips. And, and it was the passion that's kept me in the business this long. It was the passion, it was the adrenaline. It was knowing that, you know, I had to be consistent in the restaurant. That's be very, awesome. very consistent. And those table side dinners, that did teach me how to deal with people and how to talk to people. And, you know, whether somebody needed a slap in the back of the head or whether someone needed like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, you know, this is, and it, 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 it just opens up your eyes to many different ways of, of how you deal with people. Like I've had my, my young cooks, I would push them and push them. But when I knew they were, they were ready to break, I would ease off the pedal. Yeah. And I would offer them encouragement. And I did that with all of them. But they had look how they turned out. What'd you eat? Uh, a puddle jumper. They had to be pushed. Yeah. They had to be pushed when they had to be pushed. And let me tell you, I don't I gotta watch the interviews you did with them all. And and they they probably hopefully said the same things that I that I pushed them. I pushed them to be great. Yeah. Not to be mediocre. I questioned their desire to be in the business. Why, why do you want to cook? You want to cook for pay? You want to cook to work for somebody else your whole life? Or do you want your own restaurant? And that's Kevin. Kevin was, was unbelievable. He just wanted to learn so much and absorb. And then the stuff that that kid does now, I could never imagine. His passion goes to Italy to learn how to make pasta, making all, buys the best pasta machines, making all his own pastas by hand himself. He, amazing. And then Martin, Martin, the willpower, the desire to work, the, Martin just wanted, Martin's the, the great American story. He wanted what's good for his family. He, he motivated him. You know, he wanted, that kid is such a big hearted kid that, that he wanted so much, but what he wanted was, not agree. He just wanted to make a better life for him, his wife, his daughter, his family. And he did that. Great, and Luca, great, kid, great family. Yeah. And Lu Luca took a little while, but Luca should have had his own restaurant 20 years ago. And I always told him that, but you know, for whatever reasons, he wasn't ready to commit, but now the kid committed. And let me tell you something. You look at his Instagram, you read the reviews, you eat his food. I'm going next week. And, and, and yeah, my nephew, Luca, and basically, you know, it's Carmelina's on the North Shore. And I'm very proud of him. And I was so sure of him that I said, you know what? Call it Carmelina's if you want. And he's like, no, you know, I'll call it Carmine's, but not Carmelina's. That's funny. But I had that much faith and trust in him that I knew that I could give him that name if he wanted it. Yep. And that he would do the right thing. And he's been... He's been off the charts. He's working his ass off. And he was never meant to be an employee. Nah. Neither was my team. I told him he was a large, I told him he was a large, a, a lousy garbage collector. Oh my God. It was terrible. I remember when he went for, to work for you. I'm like, kid, what's the matter with you? I'm like, really? Nothing against the garbage business, Dave. I mean, I know you've done quite well with it. I used to tell my I used to tell my employees, yeah. listen, this isn't the Mona Lisa. This is the box it came in. Throw that shit away. Yeah, throw it away. I'd be like trying to figure it out. Yeah, Luca didn't love it. But you know what? Like you said, everybody takes more time. But one thing Luca said that you had talked about earlier, which all that really rang true, he said, Damien, the times that he would get the most upset is when someone had low energy. They wouldn't bring positive high energy. If they had low energy, that's the thing he said. Damien had an understanding that would bring the whole line, everybody down. You couldn't have that low energy. And you mentioned that earlier about energy. It's, and it's, uh, I think it's so true. And, and that's the difference between someone who's working because it's just a job mm -hmm. and someone who's working because they have a goal. Just like all those young guys were well, young anymore, but just like all of them, they were all motivated. Yep. They loved the business. Yeah, you know what? We could bitch and moan and curse when we're on the line. And, you know, when some asshole wants to add chicken to a puttanesca to a carbonara and it's like you know you're fucking up my food man don't do that or when somebody wants plain pasta 
under a main course. Oh, can I have a chicken piccata or chicken myself on top of pasta? No, no, I'll do anything you want. I'll respect your allergies. I'll respect your dietary restrictions, but I'm not gonna add. I'm not adding broccoli to a crazy Alfredo. This isn't a pizza we're making here. This is a dish that I created. Yeah. Dishes that my guys have created at their places. And honestly, if someone has a dietary thing, all the love to them. No butter, no butter. No this, no this. Can you do this with the red sauce instead of cream? Absolutely. Can we make another suggestion maybe? But we always try to facilitate that. But when people get crazy and they behave in a gluttonous manner, Americans love to add chicken. Well, let me tell you something, America. First of all, make sure the chicken you're eating is free range. Because that's one thing that should be free range is chicken. Chicken is fucking poison. It's full of hormones. It's full of additives. And all that shit goes in your body. So at my restaurants, we only serve free range chicken. <clears throat> and, and that's it. We're not, we're not going off that. Yeah, my chicken's going to cost a little more. But my chicken's not going to kill you. Yeah. Okay? Let me ask you. We store, got off topic here. But, yeah, it doesn't matter. But in the store the other day, I saw I saw it was a B. It was a mints, beef mints for sale, and it said humanely handled humanely. Beef what? B, it was mints, beef mints. It was Hamburg. Mints, mints, Hamburg. You mean ground meat, ground beef, ground beef, mints. Call it mints. I'm thinking M I N T S. No, M I N C E. Mints, like they refresh your breath and. Uh, Anyway, it's all your arteries. Are, yeah, it's, all right. it's go, when, it's, when did you started saying beef mince and not hamburger or ground meat? Did you know. go to England or something? Beef yeah, mince. That's a British thing. I watch a lot of. Uh, I watch a lot of. Gordon Monty Python. Python. What the hell are you watching? Anyway. You watch a lot of Benny Hill. Is what you watch? I love Benny Hill. Oh, I love British comedy. But anyway, it said humanely handled. Not a freaking thing is dead. Does it matter? Humane you mainly handled they didn't they didn't scare the shit out of them when they were ready to kill them putting them in that long line and then giving them the jolt um that you know they, they say that, that they still it, killed it they killed it but they do it in a when you when you kill something in a humane way when they don't expect the coming they're not ready for it so they're not going to get all like Arr! and from what i read and what i understood and i'm just a cook i'm no scientist but when they sense that happening, their body's releasing like all this toxin and all this shit. Really? You know? so, How do they know yeah. the cows? If, let me tell you something. Watch some of these Instagram videos with the animals. It's amazing. I don't know if animals have evolved or if we're paying more attention to them, but it's amazing how smart pigs, goats. Oh, pigs are it, smart. It's fucking ridiculous. I saw a video today. These ladies were, had their shopping bags and they're visiting chimpanzees. And there's a glass pot separation. And the chimpanzee points to the bag. I'll send it to you. <clears throat> Are you on Instagram? Yeah. All right. The chimpanzee points to the bag. The woman's looking, pulls out a banana. The chimpanzee's like, yeah. And he wants the banana and he's telling her, over the top. throw it over the wall. He's signaling <laughs> the woman to throw the banana over the wall. Uh, are you kidding me then there's of, a uh, then there's a lot of kids ball. these days it's animals have smartened up tremendously uh, it's it's amazing a lobster you know when you cook a lobster it's got got to be alive you don't want the lobster to be dead it's got to be alive when you're cooking it and i know people cruelty whatever lobster's a lobster it's not an affectionate little animal okay yeah. but you got to put that lobster in cold cold water in a big pot and just this much water not a ton and then you cover it put the heat on and as the water warms up that lobster just down and out oh, you throw a lobster in a boiling thing of water and the tail curls up and and when you pull it out the tail's all like this and you gotta no nah, no nah, you put the lobsters in cold water let them nice and relax, turn on the heat, and they go to sleep nice and slow, and then they're, they're done. Huh. You know, I like Caribbean lobster more than New England lobster. You want to know something, I Dave? I think it's more tender. Is this me, or am I crazy? No, you're crazy. New England has the best lobster in the world. I've eaten lobster everywhere. 
in Australia, in Italy, Caribbean lobster in Mexico. I like the Caribbean lobster. Caribbean lobster has no claws. Yeah. It's I only got a tail. I just think it's more tender. And it has a little gamey, little gamey, little tough. I like that. Do I like it? Yes. Yeah. But if you put a, a three pound main lobster in front of me or a Caribbean, the main lobster is sweet. You don't need to do anything to it. When you bite into it, it, when it's cooked properly, it just snaps the right way and it chews perfect and, and it's sweet. If you want a little bit of drawn butter, you have a little bit of drawn butter. You don't need it, but you can't eat a Caribbean lobster like that. I like Caribbean lobster when I, I dice up uh, green peppers, red peppers, garlic, olive oil, and then I'll put the diced lobster in and then I'll put a little tomato paste and I'll cook that off for like 30 seconds. And then I'll put some cherry tomatoes halved in there and I'll let that cook down. Then I'll add just a little bit of Worcestershire sauce and cook it over a nice, a nice rice. It's really good. So you don't end up tasting the lobster is what I'm understanding. You do taste the lobster. Masking it with every other flavor imagine. No, but it's got that gamey taste to it. It's, it's onions, uh, onions, garlic. It's, it's not onions. It's garlic, green peppers, and, and I just add a little bit of Worcestershire sauce. I mean, to each, to each his own. But a game you don't need taste is like it, it's called. I think they call it shredded lobster or something like that. And you I don't need to mince that. lobster. Mince lobster, yeah. Min you don't need lobster. to do that to a New England lobster. Uh, That's for sure. I don't. Love, I like claw. I like the claws. I'm not a big, and I like the knuckles. Oh, uh, on the on the main the main, the main lobster, lobster, yeah. The tail, the everything's good. I don't. Like the tamale that. inside, delicious. Oh, I do like that. My God. Let me tell you something. I usually don't like to shout out to big chains, although it's more local, but <clears throat> I know that uh, Legal Seafoods is no longer owned by the, the Boston guy, I forget his name, but uh, somebody bought it out. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I went to the Legal Seafood near the aquarium and I didn't been there for years, but I was dying for baked up the stuffed lobster. And not all the legals do big stuff lobster. So let me tell you something. One of the best lobsters I ever, and I'm a big food snob. One of the best lobsters I ever ate in my life. I got a two pound big stuff lobster from legal seafoods. The stuffing was delicious. Packed with scallops and shrimp. And then the Ritz cracker. Uh, I love and that. then the meat underneath was just so moist. And it was so delicious. I and, do like big stuff lobster. Oh, they, they legal seafoods, uh, the one in the aquarium, mm -hmm. the lobster that you'll ever eat. So good. I went back two more times within a month because I was just dying for it. I'm a clam chowder snob. I love clam chowder. A lot of clam chowder is too thick. Uh, yeah. And I uh, wish they would just make it not so like porridgey, you know? Yeah. There's a, and, and everyone makes it different. I like mine a little. I like mine soupier, if that's the right term. A little soupier is nice. Still. Still creamy. Yeah. I, every once in a while. Potatoes I'll, in there. Yeah. Once in a while, I'll go for the creamy, but uh, I like it with in my back. Yeah. Watch his face. Watch this. Ready? I've been working on that. Don't I look like an old man? I don't want any trouble here. I'm just trying to mind my own business, you son of a bitch. I'm so happy with that. Is that what you're going to sound like? That's what I'm going to sound like. And I'm practicing. I learned how to speak. I learned a couple of things in the last year. I learned how to speak uh, Louisiana. I can teach you. I can teach Go you in 18 ahead. seconds. Reply, re repeat after me. Fry up some gator. Fry up some gator. So you go, you know, now I'm in there for a I'm going to fry up some gator. See, now you speak Louisiana. And I can, I learned in Italy, as long as there's no Italian speakers around, I learned how to speak make, Italian. make believe Italian. And this is how you do it. You say, Say a couple of real words, then you make up two words, then you say two cheeses. So you go, hey, buonasera, la piccata no, the peccadillo no mala mozzarella. Yeah, you got it, right? The tourists thought you were like, uh, well, they thought I was a local. They gave me, they gave me coin, you know, they were giving me, they, they were going by and Venmoing me, Venmo, Venmo. Is that how you say Venmo in Italian? Venmo. Yeah, Venmo. It just, you, you, all, all these years you've been saying you should have learned Italian and you did nothing. I should have. You know what, though? The guy said to me at the uh, at the little shop in, in uh, Monopoly, he said, if you stay here 12 more months, vocabulary, no, but Italian, yes. 
But then I could just have my little translator and just figure out the vocabulary and, you know, pick I should it up. do that. The Google Translator, the best. Uh, but you never even know. Even pronunciation. Every once in a while, for pronunciation, I did. But every once in a while, even, you know, my French is sometimes terrible, sometimes awful, sometimes good, depending on how long I've been in a French-speaking country. Sometimes it's really What was good. it you said that time? Instead of shows, you said foie? Yeah, go go foie. go go show. Hey, <laughs> you never forget, do you? It's not that was a good one, because you pretend that you knew French. Uh, I just screwed it. I screwed it. But you know what? Sometimes, sometimes, I can't remember the hell I was going. That's because you're getting old. Are uh, you going to have Al, Al be on the show one day? I've had Al be on twice already. You have had from the, from, from, the, the, from the store, yeah. Albie's fruit stand, store. yeah. You know he what he has talking? a laptop in there, but he hasn't been on on the on uh, on Zoom yet. He was just on the podcast, so he'll oh, be on. No, the you got to get him live. He can do it on his phone. But you know what he taught me? We had him on probably last August or September, and it worked. I thought he was crazy, but if I you you know it drives me nuts. You go to the store. If you go to the supermarket, you got to buy more herb than you need, right? I don't need that much rosemary. I don't need that much thyme. I don't need that much whatever. Oh, you have to peel it and stick it in with the lettuce. Now, what he did is he, you get those plastic uh, ice containers and just put a little olive oil in, just a little, just enough to barely cover it, and you freeze it. Oh, you didn't know that? I didn't know that. What a great trick. I use it all the time. Yeah. Like a freezer full of them. But you got to wrap them in plastic, he said, so they don't, uh, it, the moisture doesn't, because if they, if they get uh, condensation on them, when you throw them in your pan, <laughs> you know what it and you throw it, and you're getting, you forgot to wear yeah. shoes, and you're burning your feet. You I mean, another good, another good thing to do too is, uh, like, if you grow basil, you have a lot of basil in your yard. Yeah, I do. All right, you can't use it all, obviously, right? So you get the basil, and just puree it with some olive oil. Yeah. Same thing, and freeze it. And then when you want to finish a sauce, just put like a tablespoon at the end of the sauce, and it just oh, nice, so delicious, and, and it maintains its full flavor. And, and, and you don't have to worry about the herb getting wet from the freezer. Yeah. Albie's got a sense of humor. Albie's a funny guy. He is. He's got a good sense of humor. I think I'm his favorite customer because he said, you're my favorite customer. I asked him, I said, am I your favorite customer? He said, you're my favorite customer. So I kind of teed, you know, I teed him up. Uh, I've heard him say that to other people. I think so too. Let me ask you a question. Around a corner in the North End, I can't remember the name of the little... The little uh, butcher shop it starts with a uh, Fumona. Yeah, Fumona. You ever see the guy in Al? A... Yeah, do you remember uh, what's that next door to Alby? Fumona Meat Market, two doors down. Yeah, across the street on the other side. No, no, on the other side. You're from the other side. No, it's on the same side as Alby. No, nah, that's not what I'm thinking. There's only one butcher store left in the North End. It's not a butcher store. I apologize. It's a, uh, it's a, um, you're looking at Carms, and you take a right, and you get to the first street, which is uh, Richmond, right? Richmond Street. Yeah, you take a left there, right on the left. Yeah. What's the name of that place? I can't remember that. that Lumeria? Yeah. There's a guy. Remember? Do you remember All in the Family? Remember that TV show? Were you here for All in the Family? Or I was here. Still, do you remember Stretch Cunningham? Remember Stretch, Ar oh, the tall kid. Yeah. Yes. Doesn't that kid look like Stretch Cunningham? Cunningham yeah, he works? also looks like uh, Richie Cunningham's brother. Oh, from Happy crazy. Days. Yeah, he looks like Stretch Cunningham, though. And yeah, I tall know. guy. Uh, go, oh, what does him? Goni. Yeah, he's, he's Albanian. Hungarian. Albanian, Hungarian. I knew he's one or the other. Oh, Goni is Albanian. Speaks a lot of Albanians speak very good Italian. Well, you and know he's what? One of them, fluent Italian, because well, it's on the other it's side, close, it's the other side of the Italy. But yeah. the main reason is a lot of the TV shows that they show are Italian TV shows. Oh, because it's right across the Adriatic. They're growing up with Italian TV shows. Do you ever hear that song? Albania, Albania, it borders on the Adriatic. I can see Italy. No, I never heard that song. I just made it up. It's like been it. a one-year wonder. No, I think it was on Cheers. I think Coach, that's how he remembered he was taking a test, and that's how he remembered that. Which was Albanian? No, but that's he had to take a test because he was going to get in GE. Oh, okay. So that's how I remember that song. But that's the our memory thing. You got to do that too. Yeah, Albania, Albania, because you confuse Albania with Croatia. No. Now I confuse myself. Jesus. 
what are the two capitals? Uh, Sofia and Dubrovnik. No, Sofia. What's the capital of a? Uh, what's cap? Is Sofia the capital of Albania? I think so. What's the other one? Ah, who knows? I'm losing it. I'm telling you, I'm losing it. Is it important? Ask yourself. It's not important. Although last night I was thinking about 6,000 things. I'm trying to figure out if the interview who was I was supposed to do this morning would show up. They didn't. So I was up at 6 o'clock in the morning for no reason. I ate by you, ended up, you ended up with me and Luca. Lucky you. Hey, that's a good day, though. That's a really good day. I got to tell you. Are we better than who you're going to have on? Yeah, far better. Far, far more fun, too. But I had to put my shirt on. I kept looking at my own breast, and I didn't want to see him. So you were going to do a naked interview with this guy? I was going to do an naked interview with Luca, but Luca pulled out because Luca's bigger than me, so I would have been okay. But I'm not that bad. <laughs> not that bad. But anyway, so I had 10,000 things in my mind last night. I leave Carmelina's. I got to drive back home. It's my second trip. By to yourself? Home. Yeah, because I'm going out trying to find my daughter an apartment because she's going to Northeastern. Getting where, where are you looking for apartments? Up at like the South End. We were, I was on uh, Minor Street up, and then, then I was on right on Commonwealth up, right you know, both sides of Fenway. So she's going to Northeastern? She's getting her graduate, graduate degree from Northeastern. God bless her. Yeah, we're trying everything. I tell you, finding a place in Boston. I tell you, South End, Southeast, when I was young, when we were young, that was an awful neighborhood. It's not it's nice now. That's yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess you wanted to be close to the school, but not, not too close because there's still some pretty shady areas around there. Yeah, where she is is fine. Where the okay. Place is Dart, found the place. And there's Dartmouth Street, which isn't bad. Harmon Street is great. Are you kidding yeah. me? Minor is, uh, you know, where the what's the station? Lansdowne? Is that the train station down there? Lansdowne Station? If so she's, in, she's near Camelot Square? That's where we're looking right now. That's where we're looking the last couple of days. You didn't get an apartment yet. No, we're still looking. That's why I keep going back oh. and forth to Boston every day. That's who keeps sending me these things. So where is she now? She's just graduated from uh, Merrimack, and she's working this summer, and then she's going to graduate school. Where is she living at the moment? In North Andover still, because that's where oh. she's working this summer. So we got to find a place the next 45 days. So she just sent me a text said I she I need to fill out the rest of this application for her, the parts I need to fill out for her. So Damien, I love you, but my daughters always come first. Is the North End too far for her? Yeah, I think so. They'd have to, I mean, how do you get to Northeastern from there? You got to take a train. I get to Northeastern. You got Haymarket Station, yeah, which is Orange Line and Green Line. And then you have Government Center, yeah, right at the end of Hanover Street, right there, yeah. And then you have Aquarium, yeah, which is right where the Aquarium is, which is Blue Line. So I don't know what lines, but they are all represented: red, green, orange, and blue. Huh. She would love. And she's safer in the North End. I think so too. She's you know, got me around. I'll make sure all the guys in the restaurant know. You know. Yeah, and she's friends with Nick. She loves Nick. Everybody loves Nick. I have to take this part out. All right, my friend. Yeah, if you hear anybody in the North End has got a spot, she, she needs a two-bedroom. She's got a roommate. If so you all, done, you all done with the garbage business? Yeah. I've been out for over 12 years. Oh, shit. I remember. Yeah. yeah I got to be a stay-at-home dad, and that was that. You were, like, probably one of the best garbage men I've ever met in my life. I, you know what? I showered. That's really the key to the whole operation. Was so, what was that thing, old? Old garbage men never die. We just smell that way. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I got to run. She's, I got to feel she's having a heart attack here. You got to run. I got to run. I got to get her. It looks like somebody who runs to me. I hike. Unless there's a meal. I hike every day. I, I, I do like nine mile hikes on a weekend. Good for you. Yeah, I like hiking. I like walking. I like going to. Walking's great. You should walk every day, though, not just on the weekends. I walk. I do walk every day. I do a minimum of three a day. And I just signed a thing next summer. I'm doing a cross, four day across England, coast to coast, ending in Scotland. Nice. Do me a favor. Hugs and kisses to your lovely family, okay? Thank you, my friend. One. Hey, Damien, thanks for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have. Enjoy your uh, beautiful daughter, the beautiful scenery behind you. How's Melina doing? Melina's doing great, actually. That kid was, uh, you just knew she was going to be always, I always just had a place in my heart. I knew that kid was going to be success no matter what she did. And, yeah, I mean, she got a terrible blow with the, with the pandemic because gyms in Boston yeah. They shut down, and then when they reopened, you have to go to the gym like this, and you can't breathe. So that was really moronic, and it basically killed her business. But you know, you remember when she was a little girl, she's tough, and she's, she's a, a champ. Kid. 
And she's a champ and she's a smart kid. She's just a nice kid. One of my favorites. Always has been. Always Dangerous has. Dave. Hey, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with more of Cooking Something Good Special. Thanks to my good friend, Damiano De Paolo, the man who can wear a shirt on camera. He can take his shirt off. I really should wear a shirt, so I did. I'm wearing uh, tiny underwear, too, if you want me to get up. Yeah, get up, will you? No, I can't. <laughs> okay. We'll be back right after this with more of Cooking Something Good. Am I off? Am I done? You're done. All right. When Good do time. I get my check? Yeah, we'll send you a sweater, and we'll send you a, a, a coffee mug. I don't drink coffee. Anymore. How long are you down there for? Send me two sweaters till uh, July 27th. Oh, maybe I'll sneak down and get the oh, hell out. Let me know. There's a lot of good food down here. Love to get the hell out. I need a break. All right, my man. All right, I'll see you later. Take it easy. Thank you. Dangerous Dave Duso, Kid Caponatina. Two outs, Perfect. bottom of the fifth. That brings up Damiano De Paola batting 286, 15 home runs, 56 runs batted in the wide of the pitch, high and outside ball. One remember sports sports remember sports fans for all your great dining pleasures. Carmelina's Hanover Street in the north end of Boston. Hey, that's it. Show's over. Special thanks to my good friend Damian De Paolo. Currently, he owns Carmelina's restaurant in the north end of Boston. He has owned so many restaurants over the years, and out of his restaurants have come some of the uh, best chefs anywhere in the world. He has really been a trailblazer, and we're lucky to have him and all the people who have followed behind him. We're very, very fortunate, and we're fortunate to have him on our show today. Damien, thank you very much, not just for being on the show, but for your friendship over the last 35 years. It's meant a lot to me. I don't think you'll ever really know. Cooking Something Good is a production of the CSG Broadcast Network, and all rights are reserved. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, or other accounts of this show without the express written consent of Heshi Deuce Productions, LLC, is prohibited. You can't do it. But if you call us or you send us an email or, or get in touch with us, we'll talk about it. I'm sure we'll let you use it, but you got to let us know first. Not a big deal but you do have to let us know. That's just the rules. I don't make the rules. Until next time, remember, food is fun, fun is food, and it's always foodie fun time here at Cooking Something Good. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bye now.